Hi, Joyce. How are you doing? Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, perfect. Oh, great. Yes, I had to uh, quickly change locations because my neighbor is doing some construction and they said they would be done by now, but uh, it's still going on. So, <laughs> but I, I think we'll be okay in here. How have things been? Just fine. Really good. Yes, I was in upstate New York for about a week and now I'm back. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm just working. And uh, and I see you've been um, tending your garden a lot. You've been posting some pictures uh, on social media. Yeah, as I, as I said here, I can look out in the garden and hope that the groundhog won't come. Yeah, <laughs> they're quite bad pests. And uh, how are how are Zanche and uh, Lilith doing? <laughs> um, well, I was just a sec. Oh, Lilith was under my chair. Ah. I was going to look for her. She's here, so I think okay. we're all okay. I am so eager to speak with you uh, about your new book, Zero Sum, um, which I, I found so inventive and surprising. Ah, yeah, now you can see the U.S., cover it's very different from the the UK cover yeah it's so interesting I don't have I don't have the UK cover here I'm sure they'll be sending it to me soon but the, it looks very it looks very intriguing mm. fate inside the Mobius strip very imaginative what? yeah yeah I like I'm so I'm so interested in the art of of books mm. art. and is that a, a Magritte painting on the Magritte yeah yeah, yeah. Ah. Very nice. Yeah, it's quite a different interpretation of, but uh, but yeah, I think both of the covers really speak to the the content yeah. and ideas of the stories, and and I found the the stories to be very gripping as they very vividly portray the psychology of these characters, and they they've continued to to haunt me um, because of the the issues that they raise and. There's certain imagery and scenes which have really stuck in my mind. So I had read some of these short stories when they were previously published uh, in journals and magazines, and each story is its own world. But reading the collection uh, straight through, I, I found there was this poignant progression in the the book um so for anyone who hasn't read um this this book yet it is divided into three different sections and the stories move from contemporary tales of interpersonal relationships uh between student and teacher and parent and child and friends and spouses um to the disturbed mind of a writer who is drawn to suicide to dark stories of body horror and civilization's collapse. And I know it would take uh, too long to talk about all of the stories in the book, but I think there are some common themes uh, we can discuss while referencing many of them. So I know you you wrote them over a period of years, um, but I'd first like to ask, uh, how did you go about selecting and grouping these stories together? <laughs> well, I think overall, the first section is more like domestic realism, though obviously Mr. Stickham is more of a surrealist story. Mm. The uh, The second section, the suicide is really a novella. Mm -hmm. It's like a standalone. Then the third section is more visionary. There's a world where people are seeing reality through like a, the baby monitor, seeing not seeing reality any longer, but sort of looking at the world through a monitor or through a screen, which we're doing right now, <laughs> where I think we made that kind of transition from a world of, you know, face-to-face -face experience. We've been evolving into a world that's ever more removed so that even though you and I are having a conversation in Zoom, we're not aware that it's actually some, somewhat weird. You know, <laughs> so it's just we're maybe being bounded as individuals by surveillance and by devices of electronic precision that are around surrounding us, which seems to have happened gradually in our culture, but without anyone ag agreeing to it. Mm. You know, we nobody said that I really want to be on a store surveillance film, you know. Mm -hmm. But every time I go into a store, I think London is a city 
maybe there was more than one of these cities, but isn't London a city where you can walk through the whole city and always be on a camera? Yeah, I believe so. Mm. And somebody, authorities could splice together the whole movie of what you did for like two hours. You're walking through London, through parks, and it would be like a film of you so that you're, you are never off the grid. Mm. It may be that maybe that's like that in other cities as well. I think it probably is, but I know it's true in London. Mm. And it does feel like there's an increasing um, relevance of uh, kind of Orwellian literature. <laughs> yeah, and uh, our our humanistic position and our literature is really based upon the primacy of the individual. Mm -hmm. That the individual is very important. And Kierkegaard says that the individual, individual is the highest truth and the crowd is a lie. Those are quotes from Kierkegaard mm. that I think are very relevant. But in this book, we begin with uh, Zero Sum, the title story. A young woman is trying really to control the narrative of her life the way we all do, certainly including me, and you know, trying sometimes desperately to control what's happening to you. And then as the book progresses, that sense of control is lost. Like this is not a drill, is really in a way set in this house. I got the idea for that story when we were in lockdown in March, 2020, and I was all alone in the house. I remember those days of, of the early pandemic before the vaccine, when we were all locked down in our houses, some people all alone, some people who are lucky with a, with a partner or a spouse or a family, but some of those people didn't feel that they were lucky as the pandemic went on and mm. there have been marriages that broke up and families that are dysfunctional. And so that story is set in a kind of timeless void that could be next year, you know, where we're back in our houses and there's some sort of pandemic or chaotic situation we can't control. Mm -hmm. We don't even know if there's a government anymore. We're told not to leave our houses. And they're actually something like a National Guard or soldiers here and there to make sure we don't leave our houses to spread the epidemic. Mm -hmm. And then the last story is actually the final a uh, specimen of the species Homo sapiens, just one person left, so that we as a species have lost control. It did feel like, yeah, the um, the book was really, there was a progression somewhat in time in that way, but also, yeah, how sort of society overall is evolving or could evolve into a certain situation, yeah. Yeah, then the last line of the story, though, is the future of civilization on Earth belongs to you. They're taking a vote. You know, so mm -hmm. I wanted to end on a, a, a note of positive, possible optimism that it's really, it's not too late, you know, in terms of climate change. I mean, maybe it's almost too late, but mm. we are hoping that by, you know, electing the right people and climate change uh, reform and dealing with fossil fuels and things like this that have been around for decades. I mean, the discussions have been around for decades. It seems to be we're approaching some sort of crisis. So this, the book does end with, uh, you know, the vote. The vote is up to you. And so that was meant to be a teeny bit optimistic. Mm, yeah, and I appreciate it because um, it, it, uh, it does go to quite some dark places, but it does have that yeah, note of, of optimism in it. And, um, and so I found like overall there there seem to be two predominant images that are explored throughout many of the the stories in the book. And I'd like to ask you about why um, you find these these images or concepts so compelling. So first, there is um, this image of the Mobius strip, uh, which is on the the UK cover. And um, and since you haven't um, seen in person this this book yet, I don't know if you were aware. The the publisher, um, Fourth Estate, also sent out um, this strip of paper, uh, which oh. is the kind of make your own Mobius strip, um, which was a lovely addition to it. So you connect. Uh, one part with the other, and then you form. And if anyone isn't familiar with the concept of the Mobius strips, then you you've created your own uh, 
object which it has only one side which runs infinitely some of your past fiction in stories outside of this book um you've referenced a mobius strip before as as well so i was wondering what does a mobius strip mean to you and and why do you think this image so regularly features in your creative imagination it probably is some sort of projection of my own my own sense of myself or my my deepest self where it's this this essence of some sort of distilled personality hmm. that at any age that I am is always there. I mean, maybe somewhat lost in the social self when I'm with other people, hmm. but it kind of emerges in dreams. I don't know what that inner self is that we all have. I think that it's very, very much conditioned by the society we're in. Uh, culturally conditioned, um, but yet I think there's sort of an essence of a being that never, never fades. I think we we start to experience it when we're really young, and then when we're maybe prepubescent, we start to feel this sense of a self. And the Mobius strip to me is that sense of an unspeakably deep almost unnamed self that comes before being named by your your parents mm. or being known by people like in school. And that essence, maybe I think I identify with creativity, that consciousness is always creating. And even when it's not literally conscious in our dream state, we're creating astonishing narratives. The dreams of people, I'm sure, are literally fantastic and wonderful. I mean, my own dreams sometimes astonish me. I don't know where they come from. And I've known people talking about their dreams, which are just really like the thousand and one nights, you know. Mm. So in, in my book, the Mobius Strip is connected with that irrepressible and unnameable identity of the self. Then this self becomes a social self. And that's where we enter into contention with other people. That's where the, the phenomenon of the zero-sum game begins at some point in childhood with some people, or maybe adolescence. Life becomes much more of a competition, mm. a contest. When I think of people for whom the zero-sum game was a paradigm of life, I often, often think of Sylvia Plath. You know, I win and you lose, but you if you win, I lose. Like, it was always that feeling of life being really fraught with competition. Mm -hmm. And she would rather die, in a sense, than lose. I mean, I think most of us don't look upon life that way. I sometimes, I've sometimes told my students, for instance, you're not in a competition. You know, there's not going to be be like one A or two A's and it's it's not that way. You know, students can get all A's. Mm -hmm. I suppose some students so there might be a class where everybody gets a B, but that never happens really, you know. But it used to be the case in ac the academic world in, in America, at least like in the 1960s or 1950s, where it was a zero sum game. In each class, say there are 50 people there would be like one A, uh, two A's, like it was really like a really steep pyramid. And that was known. And I think, Eric, you're probably of a later generation. And I don't think you went to school under those circumstances. However, I did. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of well known, like there's one professor, he would get one A, or maybe an A minus at Syracuse. And when I look back on it now, they were like, like little Napoleons almost that, you know, ruling a class and, and frightening people and intimidating students so that maybe they wouldn't speak out. Mm -hmm. um, I actually came out, I came through that world and I was actually very competitive as an undergraduate, but my students are not like that. And I don't think it's a good idea. I never, 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 I don't even, I don't think of students in competition, but I would never hint that they were at all. However, in the class, in the, the title story, Zero Sum, mm -hmm. um, they're in this um, philosophy seminar. So I have a number of friends who are who teach philosophy 
at Princeton and also at, at Rutgers. And I'm very interested in philosophy. So in this hypothetical class, it's sort of like a seminar taught by somebody like Quine from, how, uh, from Harvard, uh, sort of a legendary philosophy professor at Harvard, whom, whom some of the people I know knew and they studied with, but I never met him. Mm. However, in this class, the professor says, now you can all get the same grade, you know, like, I, do you want to try for individual grades or should I just all get, give you one grade and it's going to be A minus, you know? So it's kind of reducing that sense of the zero sum situation, but the students don't want to do that because they are competitive, especially the, the main character. She starts off wanting to control her narrative and then she ends up as almost like a third person being seen by the wife of the professor. She's really been... Uh, exiled from the situation that meant so much to her and the, the professor has really exiled her and by her only actions she sort of exiled herself. Yeah I felt such um, sympathy uh, for her this protagonist who's just known as Kay that's all we know about her name um, even though she is quite spiky and and at one point attempts to be um, a bit manipulative but I, I did feel very sympathetic to her because she pushes herself so hard in her studies and she feels defeated um, because she doesn't meet her own expectations or achieve that respect from the, the professor that she so desperately wants. And so can you speak a bit about the dynamic between her character and the daughter of the professor that she meets um, who's physically disabled and um, the the dynamic between them and, and how this relates to this, this concept of the zero-sum game? Well, Kay had anticipated that she would be the star student in the seminar. And the seminar really is a zero-sum game. There would emerge one person who was the most brilliant. The professor would have a special relationship with that person. Now, none, none of this is far-fetched or fantastical. It is definitely the case that in some very competitive seminars, especially in philosophy, there could emerge a brilliant student who would then become the protege of the professor. That is not un uncommon. I think almost everybody whom I know in philosophy was singled out by a distinguished mentor. That's my feeling. It used to be a world like of fathers and sons, but now there are women, there are many women philosophers now, but in the past, as far as I knew, they were mainly all male professors in my experience. So it was like a father, son, like a patriarchal situation. But women are now very strong in philosophy. So this young woman is not really wrong to think that she could have a special relationship with this distinguished person. So it's just that she it, did, it doesn't happen. But I, did, I didn't want to suggest that she was a fantasist because she actually is brilliant. And she's perhaps a little bit autistic or on the spectrum. She's not aware of other people's um, um, feelings about her and she doesn't care. She really doesn't care about other people. And the, the professor also doesn't really care about other people. His daughter says about him, oh, he won't remember any of you. As soon as you go home, he'll go in his study and go back to work. And that's, and that's really where he exists. That's his Mobius strip. The professor goes back into his study. And though he's had some students over for a, a barbecue and like a, a pleasant evening, as soon as they're gone, he's going to forget them. He goes back to his work. And there's always like no way to connect with that person. I base this a little bit on, uh, as I said, some anecdotes and things that I had been reading and told about Klein at Harvard. So one of the things is the daughter of this professor said in real life, she said, my father was the man who had meals with us. In other words, the family didn't know him at all. His deepest self was his work, but nobody could read it. Very mm. difficult kind of philosophy. You have to be very trained to understand it, which I actually am not. So if, you, if you're living with somebody, and this may be the case often, at a place like Princeton University or Berkeley or Chicago or you know Caltech, you're living with somebody in your household 
who is a brilliant person in his field or her field, and you can't follow them there. You have no idea, you really have no idea what they're doing. So for 10 years, I lived with Charlie Gross, who was a neuroscientist. And though I could read his popular work, he did write essays and articles for people who were who were like, you know, college edu educated. But if I tried to read his neuroscientific work, I couldn't read it. I couldn't understand it or attend lectures in that field. And then Charlie started to say also in later years that he could no longer follow what the younger experimenters and researchers were doing. That's the story of science and probably of philosophy too, that as the field evolves, older people don't, and they can't any longer follow the younger people. So it's a world in which it's very easy to be emotionally involved with somebody whom you don't really, really know. You only know the person who has dinner with you, mm. other person who's being nice to you, the way we're nice to our, our cats. You know, I pet my, pet my kitty and the kitty purrs, but the kitty doesn't know what I'm working on on my computer. And that, that kind of radical dissonance between the intimacy or the prox, proximacy of being close to somebody but not having any idea of what they're really doing, I, that's very fascinating to me. Moving on to another um, story, I think one of the most shocking stories in the collection is uh, Mr. Stickham, where teenage girls take terrible vengeance upon men seeking to have um, sexual relations with underage trafficked girls. And it's narrated in the collective voice of the girls. And it's so interesting how you uh, explore the way there is a sense of uh, security and empowerment of being part of this group, um, but it also leads the girls uh, to committing um, some horrific acts, which they probably wouldn't engage in if you know they were just on their own. Um, so can you speak a bit about how you went about creating this um, collective voice and, and how this manipulates the girl's sense of morality? Thank you for the question. Of all the stories that I've written in recent years, this is the, the strangest story because I don't really know why. I don't know where Mr. Stickham came from. Like in the story itself, they say, well, where did Mr. Stickham come from? And they don't really know. And they said, well, he, does he come out of the pen? Like the girl has a pen. She's drawing uh, a design of the, the Mr. Stickham, um, the, Mo the Mobius strip uh, fly paper. Some, I read this story for the first time ever about a week ago at the New York State Summer Institute writers session in Saratoga Springs. So people were asking me afterward, and I said that I really didn't know where that came from. But uh, mm. so that I usually have more of a sense of the, the context. I did some research into glue. There is industrial strength glue that is so strong, you know, the, the molecules bind with the, the substance and it's tremendously strong, you know. Mm. There's something, um, a more mild form is what we call gorilla glue. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to get that on your, your hands or don't get it in your hair. It's just so, it's like concrete. I mean, it's hard to get it off. Mm. So I think I was working with that, um, realistic fact about this glue mm. and then the idea of the mobius strip as a fly paper so i started using that as a metaphor that the men are drawn to this promise of this really illicit and really degrading demeaning and uh sort of in inhumane kind of sex trafficking that does take place i had read done some research into that well, it's very potent imagery, and I can I can imagine it was very impactful when uh, reading it it aloud. And so, something else, um, which is explored in a number of these stories, is our our sense of identity as children. Um, you know, even when we're adults, there's still I think a part of us that's you know always perpetually feels like a child. And um, and you explore this very tender question of, do my parents 
love me or do my parents love having a child? And if I were someone else, would my parents love me more or would they love me less? And and I, and this is asked um, in an extremely impactful way um, in the, the very short story, uh, Take Me, I Am Free, which feels like it has uh, the condensed power of, of a poem. And so I was wondering if you could speak about this dilemma and um, and this, this story, how you went about writing this, this very short story. I guess that's another one of the stories. I'm not sure where it, the idea came from. Mm. You know, Eric, I am a formalist. So some of the reasons, the, the reasons for metaphor in some people is a desire to create to explore forms so this story is sort of like a fairy tale mm -hmm. i wanted to have something very distilled that, that that had a kind of impersonal horrific tone of a fairy tale in which terrible things happen to children but told in a very matter-of-fact voice like it's just ordinary life mm -hmm. which is very typical of fairy tales so I was exploring, rather than a story of my usual kind, where I get into a protagonist very deeply and follow him or her through some thoughts and some introspection, and then there's dialogue, and then there's a drama, and then a conclusion. Like Rather than have this developed story, I wanted to distill something. So as you said, it's a little like a prose poem. Mm -hmm. Then the subject is often a child who's menaced. So I also got uh, part of the idea. My husband and I rented a very nice house on a hill in Berkeley called Panoramic Hill. And at one point in the hill, like going, it was very hilly. <laughs> the The roads were very twisty because it was so hilly. So there was a a place where people left things there would be a sign that said free or take me i'm take me i'm free or just free mm -hmm. and um because this was berkeley there were really nice things there uh books like people emptying out a library of really good books or works of art or postcards or odd things hand knit sweaters and there was nothing wrong with them, you know. So Charlie and I were always walking down to Berkeley to the university. It was like a 10-minute walk from where we lived. And we would sometimes take things with us. Somebody might give away a calendar. Like, well, it's still the year. Like, why are you giving it away? But anyway, mm -hmm. it was like, I'm free. And naturally, I guess I just thought, what if somebody didn't want her child? And just put the child there, you know, like I'm free. And then, but nobody else wants a child either. It's sort of like the very worst kind of fairy tale mm. where you're given away, but nobody actually wants you. So you have to be brought back home again. I have, a, I have stories like this in my a, a collection called The Assignation, which are really very short stories. And I wish that I could write more of them. I call them miniature narratives. They're mm -hmm. like one, some are like a paragraph long or a page long, two or three pages long, and but no longer. Um, maybe when I'm done with the novel that I'm working on, it seems interminable. Maybe I'll go back and try to write these short pieces because it's like writing a sonnet. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not writing a narrative poem of 30,000 lines, you're writing a sonnet. And so you keep it short and you leave out things. I've always been a formalist, mm. and I'm, but I'm still, I mean, I'm attracted to stories and people. And somehow they all come together. Well, I find it especially powerful in, in that story because even though it is so short, I feel like it's really stuck with me because I, I you get such a sense of um, the, the mother and the father's positions and um and their uh their different attitudes and um so maybe it's it's almost like there there are suggestions in the story that, that make me feel that to imaginatively you know expand the the story to 
to be much longer than it is, or or maybe it's just like the 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 power of the central subject. And and so you said this like this uh, fairy tale or nightmarish situation of a child being you know left out on the the side of of the road that um that yeah just has this really haunting quality. It's not like a philosophical um, proposition. Is there something inherently more significant? in fleshing out and developing a character is that more worthwhile like worth your time in contrast to something that's very spare and very uh say suggestive so you take a, a quintessential story by hemingway one of his early stories from from in our time the story could be like three pages long like indian camp but it'd be a tremendously powerful story but you have to read it you have to really think about it and spend time with it. If you read it once, you read it like literally, you'll read it in two minutes. Mm -hmm. And in a way that's not long enough for the emotions to set in. Whereas if you're reading a prose work by James Joyce, let's say, where you go more deeply into it, there's much more language, there's much more metaphor, there's maybe musicality of speech, and there's just more going on or Faulkner, you you spend more time with the work. So there's a kind of interesting problem or challenge of pacing. Like we, I talk about this often with my writers. Do you want your narrative to be more, say, let's say Proustian, where you're spending a lot of time in no time? In other words, people are just thinking. You're getting to know them. In Proust, the boy is lying in bed and he's thinking. Or do you want a, a, a faster paced narrative as in early Hemingway, where people are literally walking around, moving, they're in canoes, they're they're doing this, they're canoeing back, you know, like there's a lot of action in must in much of Hemingway and a lot of dialogue, but there's very little exposition. You know, it's almost like an aesthetic or a philosophical choice that the writer makes. Do you want to go deeply into, into a situation, spend a lot of time on it, and hope that the investment is worth it? Or do you want to go more swiftly and have a more like a streamlined narrative? And I, I like either way of writing. Mm. I find either or both ways of writing, I find very rewarding. I find there are things that Hemingway does in his early stories that are breathtaking. And then there are works by, this, we all read Charles Dickens. You know, when Charles Dickens got these fantastical paragraphs of visceral kinetic language describing the fog or the mist or something, you know, uh, the streets of London, you're, you're not going anywhere and, the, and nothing is, happening in a story, but you're getting this description, which is so vivid and alive. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful description in D.H. Lawrence, too. You don't get that in Hemingway. Mm. I mean, once in a while, a character will say, the hills look like white elephants. And then a few minutes later, she'll say, I don't really mean that. They don't really look like white elephants. In other words, Hemingway's not into the metaphor. He wasn't, in, he wasn't going to spend a lot of time the way other writers do establishing this sort of metaphorically rich landscape that we all love in, in Dickens and Thomas Hardy or D.H. Lawrence. Uh, it's a different kind of writing. And I, as I hear myself talking now, I'm talking sort of as a formalist where the writer is a person who chooses his or her form. Then you choose the language mm -hmm. and you choose your vocabulary and your tone and you choose whether you want a lot of commas or do you want do you want long sentences or do you want a lot of semicolons? I could I could perceive of a work in purely formal terms. Well, I have actually done that, and then I can put the story into that. Mm -hmm. The story doesn't come out of the form. The story is put into the form. So if I wanted to write a short story that was a mimicry of a fairy tale. I could put in it that story about the girl who is put down by the side of the, the sidewalk and take me on free because I have the story 
set in my mind and I remember the scene in Berkeley. So I kind of putting these things together. When I talk to my students, a lot of what we talk about is how you're going to structure your work. You have a good story, but do you really want to begin with this? Maybe you should begin with this, you know, like maybe there's, you've gone through the front door of the house. You walk through the main hall. How about going around the back of the house and there's this little door leading into the basement and you go down in the basement and you come up in the front hall. I find that really exciting to talk about with students Mm. rather than taking the obvious way in or the conventional way in. How about going through a window, you know, or how about being in a drone and looking down at the house? There are all these different ways of telling stories to me, extremely exciting. And have there been many occasions when um, you've, you may have set the form for the story you want to write and uh, have an idea of its, its length and its style and its texture, but then once you get into the story, it changes. Because I remember you, you've spoken in the past how, you know, originally you wanted Blonde to to just be a novella, and then it expanded out to be your your longest novel that you've ever written. And, and sometimes with um like your short story, uh, I think Curly Red, which then you eventually expanded into um an entire novel. Um, so yeah, has this happened very much, or or do you often just stick to this this form that you you've um, designated for the story? Well, Babysitter is probably the best example in recent years of that because Babysitter had been a story. Mm. It was a story that was a, it wasn't exactly a standalone story, but was published as a standalone story. But it, it had a lot in it that obviously seemed to be bleeding out into a, a real world that wasn't really explained. So that definitely uh, Babysitter. But in in this particular book, Uh, One story is about a very self-conscious postmodernist writer who really, in some genuine way, is trying to commit suicide. Now, in another way, he doesn't want to die. Obviously, nobody really wants to die, but he's trying to compose a suicide note. So this story became a novella, and the, the actual idea of it was how does a writer who's a perfectionist ever commit suicide because he can't get the suicide note right? Mm. And it's almost like an absurd proposition, mm. and yet there could be some reality to it. I was reading and sort of bonding with David Foster Wallace for a while. That time is kind of o- over now, though I do teach one of his stories in in my workshops very often. Here's a very short story that I like a lot called Incarnations of Burnt Children. But that story is like a spare, uh, it's like a prose poem. It's a beautiful story. But um, the more quintessential David Foster Wallace is extremely uh, introspective and and garrulous and goes goes deeply and, and also widely. It just... There's a whole flood of language and lots of uh, digressions and flashbacks or associations. It's like a mind, an interesting mind. I believe David Foster Wallace's father may have been a philosophy professor. But anyway, he's he's um, he's somebody that if you're interested in philosophy, you can relate to. You just sort of open one of his books anywhere and just start reading. The voice is very compelling. And he has a story called The Depressed Person, in which a depressed person is actually a woman, as if the male writer who is depressed has to push off the weakness of depression onto a female protagonist, which I thought was interesting in itself. Mm. So the suicide is basically appropriating some of the language of Wallace, but then making up most of it. Uh, I think ultimately... Um, there may be some credit. Like I think ultimately I use like one sentence of his, mm-hmm. which I give credit to. This idea that the re- that the reality in front of us is has to be qu- constantly qualified. You can't just say something simply. You have to qualify it, and you talk about a lot of other things. So I loved writing that. 
story, but it got longer and longer mm. and longer. And then I knew from a mutual friend of ours that he, David Foster Wallace, had had electroconvulsive shock treatment. So shock treatments are now possible treatments for people with severe depression. I think they are not the first line of defense. I think they, the shock treatments come when everything else has failed. But they do, they do work with some people. Hmm. It's not really known why, but they may not work for everybody, and they may not work permanently. So, uh, dealing with depression and the making of a, in this particular case, a somewhat like a bad, uh, like black humor. Like he knows that he's being ridiculous, and he knows the whole thing is, is silly. He's so embarrassed. At the same time, he does have this highly competitive side of him. He's got to write a perfect suicide note. Mm. And then uh, his life, he he divides up between reasons to commit suicide, reasons not to commit suicide. So it's like he's got this, every day he's thinking about this. Well, I really want to commit suicide. The life is awful and, and I hate what I'm doing and all that. Then the reason not to commit suicide would be that if you do, Maybe the next day you learn that you won a huge literary prize. So then wouldn't that be weird? Or a really bad review of a book of yours just came out and then you commit suicide and people will think, oh, he committed suicide because he got a bad review. And you you know, you know, can't do that. So there are all these kind of comic reasons that he has for committing suicide or not committing suicide. And of course, ultimately, I'm just saying this parenthetically, with with sorrow. Real, I mean, David Foster Wallace did in fact commit suicide. So he actually did. He stepped out of the frame of the story that I'm writing, and in a kind of existential way, he opted out of all the options that I'm dealing with. So my story is sort of like homage to a writer who is no longer with us. And it's like an alternate ego bonded with me. It's like my own self with him creates this something called the suicide. I don't know whether that makes any sense at all, but I, I have a number of stories and I, I know that you're familiar with the sleepless nights and my stories of- uh, Other writers and- towards the the end of their lives um yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you um about that and if because it does feel like you have this fascination for fictionally writing about the the end of writers lives um so in in the past you've written about Edgar Allan Poe and Mark Twain and Robert Frost and Henry James and Ernest Hemingway and uh H.P. Lovecraft and the the story about H.P. Lovecraft I found very haunting oh. and powerful so so I was wondering what what does draw you to writing about these the lives of these authors and and the ends of their lives well I'm so I'm so drawn to that maybe it's this little Mobius strip I was talk, trying to talk about mm. in a sort of faltering way that each one of us has inside us this uh, yearning or wonder or childlike capacity for creativity and uh, infinite curiosity And so each writer, each of us is sort of like, in some weird way, the same person or we're twins, so that I feel I can enter into that essence of Emily Dickinson really easily. I mean, I whenever I read Emily Dickinson, Mm -hmm. I really identify with her in so many ways that I read about her, like in biographies, and I really, really just feel I could be that person. If I lived next door to her, we would be fast friends. We'd be really girlfriends. And yeah, Mm -hmm. at at the same time, and I think, well, I'm a person who's been a professor. I've been like in the public world for decades and I've been married twice. I'm nothing like Emily Dickinson. Mm -hmm. So like, it's like somebody taps you on the shoulder and says, Joyce, you're nothing like Emily Dickinson. But I know in my heart, I am. I am very much like her. And I feel when I read her work that if I had written that, what would I mean, you know? And I feel the same way with Henry James and definitely with Hemingway. Mm -hmm. Um, People who are 
pushed into a corner who are become desperate? How do they find a way out? Um, I think we've all been in those positions. Mm-hmm. Or even writing about Mark Twain, he had this predilection for young girls, like pre pre pubescent girls. Not sexual. It really wasn't sexual. I don't even think it was erotic. I think it was connected with being a father mm-hmm. who had lost his daughter. And though I'm not a father who lost his daughter, I just really felt I understood Mark Twain very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, so whenever I write about a writer, it's like there's some sort of bonding. And I'm nothing like David Foster Wallace either. Now, Harold Brodke, who's a name sort of forgotten, Harold Brodke once came up to me at a gathering, a literary gathering, and he said, you know, I had really wanted to have a career like yours. Instead, as you know, maybe you know, Harold Brodke was working on one novel for like 30 years. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, he just couldn't finish it. Mm. Finally, he did, and it wasn't considered a, a great novel, but... He said to me, I had wanted a life and a career like yours where I would publish a book every year or two and get feedback and have readers and get critics and reviews and then write another book and have a career. He said, I don't know why this happened to me. And I just thought it was such such an unexpected conversation. Mm. Uh, Harold Brodke was older than I was and very revered. He he had a very high uh, stature in the literary world, which I think is sort of whittled away or faded now. Mm. But when I was a young writer, Harold Brodke was one of the stars. So for him to come up to me at a party, it was at Dan Helpern's house, I think, mm. uh, and talk to me that way. I just thought that was so interesting. Mm. So Harold Brodke was feeling that kind of kinship that we all have if we're writers. Even though the world sees us differently, there's a part of us where we're almost like twins. Mm. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, it does. Because I And I think it's one of the things that, that make the um, the story, the the novella, um, the suicide, so powerful because I could really feel this um, this sense of empathy with him, you know, as a writer, as an artist. Um, he was driven to to create, um, but but what's so especially compelling about it is because there's this tension in it where um, there I felt this empathy for him, but also this critical distance because of his increasing paranoia and how um, his wife's identity becomes completely subsumed to um, his own needs. And so how that that tension plays out over the, the course of the novella, um, I think is, is so fascinating. And um, so I, I, I'd i like to ask them, um, move on to um, the the final three stories in the book, because um, they they feel like they they almost follow this uh, timeline where the the environment and society is collapsing to the point where, um, and the, as as you mentioned before, there is only one Homo sapien left um, whose life has been unnaturally extended. So I, I was wondering, did you write these stories? I'm thinking of them as a set piece, or when you were putting this collection together, did um. Did you arrange them in this way? So because they just they felt like they they naturally followed on from one another. Well, I think, Eric, that when we're writing out of some sort of um, interlude in our lives, the stories that we write tend to have thematic relationships. Mm. So there could be a whole year of your life in, in, in quarantine or in the pandemic where each story you write or a poem or a novel um, is sort of out of that same place. So thinking of a kind of existential dilemma of our species is something that we were doing, I think, during the pandemic, more maybe more than now. And this is sort of a an ongoing crisis, I think, in the United States between people who want to look to the future and say, forget about COVID, and people who are more scientifically oriented say, well, wait now, we can't just forget about COVID. You know, it might it might come back and so forth. So I, I was just saying that during the pandemic, 
people tend to be thinking along lines, maybe more starkly existential, you know, like, who am I if I'm not at my job? I'm not going out. I'm not allowed to go in stores, you know, mm-hmm. and I can't see my friends. And suddenly I'm just in my house, like literally, who am I? So a lot of, I think a lot of us were thinking about that kind of uh, existential sense of the self, the very skeletal being. Mm. And so these stories are not stories about personal relationships or people coming into contact in some emotional way. They're more like stories about individuals facing a void. We find it much more engrossing to face one another than to face the void. You know, like that is pretty hard. You can't, it's like looking into the sun. Mm. I saw the movie Oppenheimer. Did you see that yet? I haven't. I'm going to see it this weekend, so I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Well, uh, I don't want to get on a tangent about that, but certainly Robert Oppenheimer and some of his colleagues were looking into that void, you know, for years, working on the Manhattan Project, Mm -hmm. uh, splitting the atom, doing things that seemed very, very unnatural, and maybe, maybe a terrible mistake. But most of us live lives that are very domestic and everything is close at hand and people will fret over what they're going to wear or what they're going to have for dinner or which restaurant to go to. You know, everything is kind of really, the ceiling is pretty low Mm. or why haven't I heard from my friend or I should call somebody, you know, the kind of constant wheel of distractions that are meaningful and, and, you know, give a lot of uh, emotional um, support to our lives. But then when that's taken away, you're sort of looking at the void, uh, you start thinking in terms like of the whole species and how did we get here and questions like that, which is what the stories, yeah, at the end. Uh, my novel Breathe has threaded through it, this possibility that there's been a, a brain infection uh, that there that the main character is not actually uh, walking around and conscious and going through all the things she's going through. She may, in fact, be in a fever state. And I wanted to keep that option open that the novel or any novel can be that I write, any novel could be a chronological story. At the same time, it could be posthumous. Like Blonde is a posthumous autobiography in a sense told by Norma Jean Baker but you don't have to read it that way you can just sort of read it as a story beginning when she's a girl and going through her whole life and ending when she dies as a chronological story and uh, Babysitter has a chronological story at the same time I wanted this little possibility that outside of time there's a personality trapped in a fever dream uh, maybe maybe posthumous and he or she is thinking through the whole life. I find myself in that position a lot, thinking back over my life. So if you're, if you're going to write about your life, say, Eric, you're writing about something that happened when you're 17 years old, you could write about it in, you know, in real time and chronological time. But you could also write about it as a, as a, as retrospective where you're thinking. You're now whatever age you are, you're thinking back to that self. So you have little sentences here and there that suggests the present time, but you're in the past time of the story, I find that much more interesting, a kind of double, a double time. There are so many multiple possibilities in, in our lives and ways our lives could have gone. And and I know you've you've written about this um, in, in such an interesting way before. Um since you since you mentioned the, the movie Oppenheimer, I, I want to ask if you'd um if you've seen the the movie Past Lives yet um greg johnson told me it's out in cinemas in in america um, or if you're aware of it um i'm aware of it i saw previews it looks beautiful it's a korean film is that yeah yeah it's um by a, a um, director who's a korean american and um uh yeah such i i i think um you'd find it really interesting really relate to it um it's so 
artful and beautiful, um, you know, how she explores all these um, ideas in, in the film. Um, but, um, but thank you so much for um, discussing this book with me. Um, obviously, I'd, I'd encourage everyone to, to read it. Um, it's such a fascinating new collection. Um, and if you do read it, um, get in touch with me and comment because I, I'd, I'd like to discuss the, the stories with more people. And if um, there's, there, there are so many more stories individual stories to discuss in this book um but uh but i don't want to to keep you too um too long uh, but just as a way of wrapping up I, I was just wondering what what are you um working on now um have you completed um the the novel butcher have you completed revisions for that and well good eric i'm so sorry i'm sort of looking around my, my kitty left looking for the cat. My, my kitty i'm sorry there's no kitty today oh. the has disappeared <laughs> Yeah. Banshee's out in the enclosure, and um, unless we could stop and I could bring her in, well, maybe is is that maybe when I yeah, if you if you want to, um, but if uh, I'll get her in, in a minute. Well, no, butcher is all is all set for spring. I think it's spring two thousand twenty four. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but the novel I'm working on now is so exciting. <laughs> it's so much fun. I mean, it's just. Um, very experimental and it's um every, every time i write every time i work on it i just it's just really exciting i sort of feel like lewis carroll writing alice in wonderland or something it mm. it begins well i can't i can't get into it it's it's called there never was a time when i was not in love with mr fox and it's <laughs> about this francis fox who is this very charismatic very popular middle school teacher who has a kind of enthralled um, students, girls especially, and he's sort of like a Pied Piper, and he gets involved with one or two his students, and and it's a catastrophe. Anyway, the whole story is about his basically being dismembered. Like you find parts of his body in the beginning of the story. Hmm. <laughs> a woman goes out walking her dog and finding some part of a body, you know, and somebody else finds another part. So it's a purely, uh, it's very formalistic. It's very playful and experimental. And it's not based on anything real. I mean, it's not, there's not a real, there's not a real person who is the model for this. So I want to say that very, very clearly. <laughs> so now I will go and see if I get a kitty. So. Okay, great. Just... Thank you. Ah, you found Sanchi. Yay. Sanchi. <laughs> so heavy yeah i don't know what's a... happened she is so incredibly heavy and she's sort of <laughs> wet she was out in she was out in the catio <laughs> i love how long her whiskers are <laughs> oh yeah wow <laughs> for people who are only watching this for zanchi <laughs> she is so heavy what's happened to you yeah Wow. I, mean, I don't want to be fat shaming her. <laughs> no, but... She's not fat. She's no. mostly fluff, but she's incredibly heavy. I can hardly hold her. Oh. Very bulky. It also seems oh, to be a no, bulky. No, you, don't, you don't want to call a girl bulky. <laughs> no. <laughs> Fluffy. She's yeah. got what's called fluff. I think it's called fluff. <laughs> she's wonderfully floofy. <laughs> And I'm all for covered in cat hair. Care. Well, this, this was a wonderful end to the uh, Mobius strip. <laughs> yes. So nice to talk to you. Yeah, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Um, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I, I really looking forward to uh, your your next novel and and good luck on uh, working on this new one. Yeah, it sounds absolutely fascinating. A lot of fun. Well, bye bye. Bye, Joyce. Thank you.